Bitcoin is an idea that causes a continuous rethinking and reevaluation of our ideas around money. And money is a global technology for exchanging information and value. Our guest today thinks it's something much bigger than that, is a technology for harnessing energy that is putting us on a path towards a species level evolution on something called the Kardashev scale, which is a theoretical measurement of a society or a civilization's ability to harness energy on a planetary or a solar level. And Bitcoin is something that might be putting us on a path with ascending towards an entirely new era of civil of human civilization. Yoni Appleberg is an author and YouTube content creator, longtime Bitcoiner and a futurist and has some fascinating ideas about Bitcoin and the Kardashev scale and what it means for the future of humanity. I'm Scott Deedles. I'm the CEO and founder of Block Rewards. And part of our mission in bringing Bitcoin to the workplace is helping people understand how it will help them. So if you're interested to learn something about how Bitcoin might be the catalyst for the next era of humanless civilization, stick around. This one is a wild one. Okay, welcome to another episode of the Block Reward Podcast. We are headed down a mind-bending journey of Bitcoin and the radical transformation of human consciousness through the elevation of technology with our special guest this week, Yoni Appleberg. Yoni, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Maybe just for our listeners who might be new to you, can, can you give us just a quick, uh, a quick introduction to yourself and uh, tell us a little bit about your background? Absolutely. My name is Yoni Appleberg. I reside in Sweden. I began my Bitcoin journey in about 2015, 2016, mine fiat as a medical doctor. And I have a passion for literature, psychedelics, chess, and future technology. I am also a mixed martial artist and I am an author. I have published the book Abundance Through Scarcity, which has done quite well in the Bitcoin space. It is a book about the importance of Bitcoin for the future of human civilization. And it takes a sort of sci-fi approach to the question, what is Bitcoin and what does it do for civilization? So yeah, I guess that's uh, that's uh, a introduction for people who don't know who I am. Very cool. I didn't know the chess part about you and I'm a, I'm a chess enthusiast myself, so. Oh, you are? Oh, that's, that's amazing. We should have a game after this podcast. I would love that. Yeah, I. this is a, this, a sidebar conversation. We're going to be talking about how Bitcoin changes the way, maybe thought paradigms is a way to phrase it. And and chess, I think, does that too. You know, chess, when, you, when you play chess often and you think about chess, chess changes the way you think about everything, which I think is also true of Bitcoin. Oh yeah, there are all kinds of uh, life lessons embedded in chess, which I think on the surface can be difficult to, to understand. But as you play more and as you study the greats, you see how chess really is a rabbit hole of its own with a lot of life lessons embedded. And they're both systems that exist on a fixed set of rules. So in chess, we have we all have the same a fair opportunity for the equal information, which is also true in Bitcoin. Yeah, so, so we are going to be uh, we're going to be talking about this idea of what Bitcoin may mean for the advancement of human society uh, at a sort of species level. As a starter, the question we we ask each guest every week is. First, what, what is Bitcoin? It is a more profound question than I think most people realize. And I think it depends on what angle you approach Bitcoin from. So the answer can be virtually anything. But like if you ask me, I think the most poignant answer is that Bitcoin is an, it's an economic psychedelic. That's the way that I explore Bitcoin currently. So for me currently, it is an economic psychedelic in the sense that it, it exposes the flaws of the current monetary system. It lays them bare for us to see. It holds up a mirror to all, all that is wrong with our current system. Psychedelics do. And it introduces a form of hyperconnectivity into the economy, much like psychedelics do in the brain, meaning that it creates a space for communication that is unparalleled. So when we take psychedelics, it introduces plasticity into the brain, which makes the brain malleable. And Bitcoin does the same for the economy. It introduces plasticity, 
which allows us to change the, the economy. So Bitcoin is an entirely new kind of economic operating system, one that we haven't fully explored yet. But given that it's just like psychedelics increases the number and strength of neurological connections in the brain, Bitcoin increases the number and strength of economic connections across the globe, which grants us new capabilities as a civilization, much like psychedelics uh, grants us new capabilities as conscious beings through a neurological hyperconnectivity. So this is the way that I explore Bitcoin currently as an economic psychedelic. It exposes the flaws. It creates plasticity for us to change those flaws. And it does this by introducing healthy money that cannot be corrupted to spy on you, to steal from you, or to uh, uh, fund wars. But Bitcoin is, as I said, it depends entirely on who you ask because Bitcoin has different use cases. I mean, it is a protocol. It is money. It is a truth signal. It is a container for truth, unlike anything we have ever had before. Yeah, that's a really interesting, that's the first time I've ever heard the term economic psychedelic. And I was, found my mind racing as I was listening to you talk, trying to wrap my mind around what that is. And my my initial reaction was, yeah, they, it's also this idea that a psychedelic provides you sort of a new viewpoint to a vantage point to look at traditional ideas you've held on to from a completely different angle which can sort of dislocate and create create new ideas. So there is this, uh, when I explain uh, the effects of psychedelics on the mind, I often resort to the Snow Hill analogy. I'm sure you're aware of it. So for the listeners who don't know, it goes basically like this. So if you picture your mind as a snow hill, this is a famous analogy. If you picture your mind as a snow hill and your thoughts and behaviors as sleds going downhill, carving grooves in the snow. Over time, these grooves become deep and virtually impossible to deviate from. So you go down these slopes and over time, it becomes increasingly difficult to explore new territory in your cognitive landscape because your thoughts and your behaviors become so ingrained that they create deep grooves in your cognitive landscape. Meaning that if you have created a set of behaviors and thought patterns that are harming you or basically created a, a story about yourself that is limiting and limiting to you. Like I could never run a marathon. I could never write a book. I could never find love or whatever that story is. Or maybe I could never quit alcohol. Whatever that story is, whatever those thought patterns, whatever those behaviors are, the more that you are engaged with them, the harder it becomes to deviate from them because they create grooves in your cognitive landscape that you cannot escape. But psychedelics act as fresh snowfall on that hill, which gives you the opportunity to choose a different path, to explore new territory in your cognitive landscape. And to so it increases plasticity in the brain. It allows you to change your thoughts and your behaviors. It doesn't force you to, but it gives you an option where you didn't have one before. And Bitcoin does exactly the same with the economy. It shows us what's wrong and it gives us that plasticity to change those things that are wrong by acting as a fresh snowfall on the economic landscape. Because we have stories about the economy that are incredibly harmful to human society. For example, state control. For hundreds of years, we've had the false narrative in society that we need a state to control money and to issue money in order for money to function and have value. Bitcoin holds up a mirror to this idea, exposes the flaws in this idea, just like a psychedelic does, and also introduces plasticity into the economy, allowing us to change the story by introducing healthy money that is incorruptible, that the state cannot control. Another example, inflation. We have had this story, this uh, particular story about how money should work since the introduction of the Fed in 1913, basically. And... Um, Since 1913, we have gradually gone off the gold standard. And in 1971, we severed the tie altogether. And we have thereafter built on the story that in order for the economy to function, we need a certain amount of inflation. Uh, Both monetary uh, monetary inflation leading to price inflation. The Bitcoin challenges this idea by showing us that we can both separate money states and the economy will still flourish and we can have an economy without inflation and the money doesn't die, the economy doesn't die. It works quite well 
In fact, it works better than it does in the fiat system. And we're not just theorizing this. We show this by creating our small citadels when we have Bitcoin conferences, where we have a circular Bitcoin economy. And you and I trade in Bitcoin. You sell your, I sell my books for Bitcoin. I don't accept the dirty fiat. And I pay my Uber driver with Bitcoin. I go to, I use BTC map and I go to all the places that accept Bitcoin. And we show that this works well. There's, um, there's no question about that. Uh, so yeah, the current narrative about the economy is that we need a state and that we need inflation for the economy to work. Otherwise, it collapses, basically. But Bitcoin holds up a mirror to this idea and says, no, this is not accurate. And you we now you now have the option to change. And it, and it sort of simultaneously functions both as the thing that allows the change and the thing that allows us to think about the change, which then drives us an evolution of our understanding. Much like psychedelics do. Very cool. I like that you started with fiat because I, I think it, 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 it makes sense as a logical starting point for our conversation. We're talking about technology and money is a technology. Like, you know, the Fed isn't a a naturally occurring, it's not like a forest, like it's a human thing that was invented. And I've heard you talk about this first uh, fiat as a technology that is hierarchical. And, And I like to think about fiat as a falling under a broader umbrella of centralization technologies. To me, centralization itself is a period of innovation, predates the internet. And we still have some centralization technologies that are remnants of that era as we're processing through this uh, the stage of human evolution. But maybe could you just talk a little bit about fiat money as a technology? Sure. So there's a lot of Bitcoiners hold a grudge against the fiat system, but I don't think it's fair. I think there is reason to steal, man, the case for the existence of a fiat system. The fiat system has... Uh, come about through necessity, not because people are evil. We used to be on a gold standard and the gold standard was wonderful. Uh, we had sound money and it works great. But during the gold standard, we, with the gold standard, we could not globalize the economy. So we needed the fiat system in order to globalize the economy. We needed paper money. We needed digital money. And we needed uh, centralized control over this money in order for globalization to work. And it has brought us here where we are today, and it has does, done wonders for civilization. But we are done with it now. The fiat system, unlike Bitcoin, Bitcoin is not just the uh, not just the rocket booster on the rocket that would bring us to a certain altitude and then fall off. Bitcoin is the rocket. It is final money. It is immortal money. It is the last form of money that humanity probably will ever, ever need. The fiat system, on the other hand, were like those rocket boosters. It brought us to this altitude. But now those boosters have fallen off and we are in the rocket, we're in Bitcoin, and now we can just head to the future. I think you answered it beautifully with the analogy of the rocket, because I couldn't agree more. I think that, you know, all of these sort of centralization technologies could be fairly categorized as having had a need for the time. And I think that's sort of like where we are today is that it's not obvious to everyone yet that 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 central technology that is common among all of the centralization uh, things that emerged out of centralization. All of those things are sort of like undergoing a redundancy now as as we're prosa- moving through this uh, evolution of technology. Yeah, and money is a wonderful, very human technology. I think money is far older than we think. I think Andreas Antonopoulos popularized the idea that money is older than than uh, written language. And the reason we know this is because the very first written language we have discovered, drawings in caves are of ledgers, money. Ledger is a monetary technology. And when we look at children, they invent money when they play. There is virtually no place in society where money doesn't exist. It, it is always created where it doesn't exist naturally, whether as cigarettes in prisons, or as marbles among children, it it would always come about. And money is this wonderful technology. It is is a mind-blowing technology. It is a technology that allows you to store and safeguard the value of your labor in a token that you can move in time and space. And I think that is just magical. Like, if if money didn't exist, and I asked you to create a technology that can store and safeguard the value of my labor, in something that I can move through time and space. I mean, that, that would be quite challenging. But we have that, and that is money. And it is a very human 
technology because it, it just naturally evolves wherever humans go. And it is a technology that allows us to coordinate our resources and orchestrate the global workforce. And it allows us to cooperate across countries and continents and across generations. I mean, there, there are very few technologies that are as powerful as money. It, it is truly a marvelous technology. And that is why Bitcoin is such a fascinating, fascinating rabbit hole because it is the epitome of perfect money. It is the first time that I think humanity has come across a technology that is, is so perfect as Bitcoin is. I sound a bit evangelical about Bitcoin, but it, it is probably because I am exploring these new, these new uh, alleys in the Bitcoin rabbit hole that have made me fall in love with Bitcoin yet again. I mean, this, this happens time and time again, that you find aspects of Bitcoin that just um, rekindles your love for it. And for me, it has, has recently been the uh, Bitcoin as an economic psychedelic and Bitcoin as Kardashev type one money. Yeah. And to close the loop on, on the sort of evolu- the, your idea of the evolution of money, you know, uh, viewing money as a technology, I think it, it's important to, to consider then the idea that there should be a continuous evolution of our understanding. Like any other technology, it should improve. And tech improvement, innovation more often looks like sort of step function improvement. It's nonlinear. What comes next often looks so different than what came before it. Like that this is the nature of innovation. And so, so it, it should be the case that whatever comes after fiat might be so different than what came before it, that it would be not immediately obvious or easy to understand. I do want to spend a lot of time today talking about this idea of the Kardashev scale. And for people who are, who, who are familiar with it, uh, let's, start, let's just start there. What, what is the Kardashev scale? Sure. The Kardashev scale uh, was introduced by Nikolai Kardashev, a Russian, sorry, Soviet, actually, uh, astrophysicist in, the, in 1964. It is a three-tiered system that classifies civilizations based on their energy consumption as a proxy for their technological sophistication. And there's a huge spread in terms of what the tiers are. So could you maybe give us a little bit of a, yeah. For sure. So a type one civilization consumes about 10 to the power of 16 watts. And that is, and if we look to what um, that would translate to uh, in terms of technology, they would be entirely planetary meaning that they uh, control all of the energy that is accessible on, the, on their home planet, whether that's from their host star, uh, the, the energy that reaches them from their host star, the volcanic activity, uh, tectonic plate movements, and all the natural resources, all the natural elements on the planet, they control that, meaning that they also control tectonic plate movements. They also control the planet's orbit, they have full control over, the, over their planet. Needless to say, we are not yet a type 1 civilization. Then there are the uh, type 2 civilizations, and they are, they are quite fascinating. They, I think they consume about 10 to the power 26 watts, and they are stellar. They control the entire energy output of their host star. And you do this using technologies like Dyson spheres. A Dyson sphere is a theoretical megastructure proposed by physicist Freeman Dyson in the 1960s. And they are uh, structures that encapsulate the entire star, uh, truly uh, gigantic structures that extend out into the uh, solar system on which the, uh, the species would live. And these civilizations, they have extended their reach beyond their home planet. They, can, they have colonized their entire solar system and they have the extraordinary capability to extract energy, data, and raw material, not just from every planet in their solar system, but probably from multiple star systems. They have begun uh, their journey outside of their own solar system. So that this is, a, uh, this is a truly fascinating type of civilization, should they exist. And uh, uh, just as an uh, interesting side note, uh, in the SETI program, uh, in a search for extraterrestrial extraterrestrial uh, life forms and and civilizations and intelligence we look both for biosignatures and technosignatures a biosignature is something like an organic molecule in the exoplanet's atmosphere atmosphere like oxygen carbon dioxide methane gas and so on 
something that reflects biological activity on that planet. An exoplanet, just for a definition, is a um, planet that is outside of the solar system. And then there are technosignatures. Technosignatures are signs of technology built by an intelligence. And one of those technosignatures that the SETI program looks for is Dysospheres. So I think that's just fascinating. Then there are the types three civilizations, and they are galactic. They control an amount of energy corresponding to an entire galaxy. And this would translate to being able to control uh, black holes, for example, having black hole generators, which would be a powerful, powerful weapon on the cosmic scene. And they probably control quasars and they travel the galactic space lanes. Uh, it's very, very difficult to speculate what these entities would even be like. So those are the three-tiered system. Then Carl Sagan, the astronomer and author, he came along and he extended, he extrapolated this scale and, and uh, created a formula around it so that we can actually ca calculate our, our own placement on the Kardashev scale. And he envisioned also the type four civilizations, type five and type six civilizations, uh, which is also, they're also quite fascinating, those civilizations. So there's sort of two key metrics as we're progressing through this theoretical evolution of a, of a species, and they have to do with control over energy and, and control over information. A fair way of saying it? I think uh, control over energy is sufficient. Okay. And this, I, I, I wanted to, the, the idea of the Dyson sphere, I think is a very cool, uh, I didn't know that SETI was, was uh, searching for uh, evidence of Dyson spheres elsewhere. Obviously, we are not, as you mentioned, we're, we're not even anywhere near being a type one. So w w the theory is that we're on our way to one day being a type one and that your idea is that Bitcoin is perhaps a key marker on this journey. Oh, yes, absolutely. That's a wonderful segue. Uh, thank you. <laughs> so, yes, we are currently about, we, we remain a type zero civilization, uh, but we are gradually advancing because as we are controlling more and more energy, so every civilization evolves uh, through the control over more and energy, but also by means of their communication technologies. And I believe that control over energy and communication technologies pretty much define how technologically sophisticated a civilization can be. And it just also happens to be that they can, they can correlate these two uh, technologies, com communication technologies and, control and uh, technologies for control over energy. So we are gradually advancing. I... I think I've said this uh, in my talks before uh, a few times. So we have evolved as a technological uh, civilization through our communication technologies. We can imagine a world without roads, without ships, without airplanes, without a spoken language, without written language, without postal services, without the internet, and without monetary networks. And and then our civilization is virtually gone. These are the pillars of our civilization, our communication technologies. And Bitcoin is essentially our most recent communication technology. But it is not our first type one technology. Our first type one technology is actually the internet. Quite often surprises me that when I ask people just for fun where the internet is, uh, people have no idea where the internet is. This is especially fun if you ask younger people where the internet is. They tend to think it's uh, in the routers, in the air, in space. Like people have no idea where the internet is. Yeah, like satellites. Yeah, like, but, but it's, it's quite fascinating that we've come so far that the internet is so ubiquitous now that I mean, you and I, we grew up in, in the pre-internet era, which is, which is a fascinating time to be alive. I'm so grateful to have seen both eras because it is the first time uh, we, we saw the emergence of the first Type 1 technology, which it, it just gives me goosebumps to, uh, to think about. But the internet, is, it is our first megastructure. It is our first megastructure, and it is deployed in the oceans. The internet lives in the oceans. If you Google the internet, and go to images, you will see the internet as a megastructure deployed in the oceans. And when you look at that image, an image of the internet in the oceans, it, it is very evident that it, it is fundamentally a planetary technology meant for global information exchange. 
it is our first truly planetary technology, unhindered by politics or any of this. This they are medieval heritage. It is a um, type one technology for the communication of information. And shortly after the emergence of the internet, we saw the emergence of Bitcoin, which is our second uh, type one technology. And what we did for information with the internet, we have now done for value with Bitcoin. Bitcoin allows us to exchange value person to person across the entire globe in cyberspace without the need for a third party. And this makes it planetary. And this has never existed before. It is, a true, it is truly a planetary technology meant for global value exchange. Bitcoin is Kardashev type 1 money because it allows us to organize like a type 1 civilization. As I've said in my talk before, if, if you want to play chess like a 2000 ELO rated chess player, you have to play chess like a 2000 ELO rated play, uh, chess player. You can't just be a 1000 rated player and expect to somehow become a 2000 ELO rated chess player. You have to actually play like a 2000 ELO rated chess player to get there. And it, it is to say, it, it, it sounds trivial, but it's, but it's not. Like you actually have to organize like a type one civilization. If you want to be a type one, type one civilization, you have to use technology like a type one civilization. If you want to be a type one civilization, and we are gradually advancing now. We are gradually advancing in our communication tools. Like we have the internet and we have Bitcoin. We have these two protocols for information and value exchange that allow us to organize, to, uh, to coordinate our resources and our workforce and to cooperate across generations and across continents like a type one civilization. We now have those technologies which means we are now beginning our journey up the Kardashev scale towards becoming a type 1 civilization. But th this, is, uh, this is just one of the reasons Bitcoin is a type 1 technology. Uh, it allows us to organize, to act like a type 1 civilization, but it doesn't, just, it doesn't get us there immediately. It is a prerequisite for us to become a type 1 civilization. So now we have that protocol for value exchange without the need for third parties and. Um, a truly global um, monetary network. Like you could argue that the dollar also works like that, but no, no it doesn't. Uh, like, yeah, we can send dollars across uh, across borders, but that is uh, that does not qualify because, as you said, the dollar is uh, the dollar is hierarchically organized. It is hierarchically organized. It is a closed system. It is centralized and it is exclusive. Bitcoin, on the other hand, is, is network-centric. It is uh, open and neutral, and it is truly planetary money for that reason. I believe that Bitcoin is much more than a technology capable of changing the way we think about money. It's a mind virus that has the ability to rewire how we conceptualize interacting with each other and how we organize our societies. Our world today is a reflection of the intrinsic characteristics of the money that we are forced to use. Fiat money runs on greed, theft, and violence. Bitcoin has the potential to allow us to substitute those out and replace them with consensual interaction, community, and hope. Not everyone who's trying to understand Bitcoin wants to become an expert in central banking and currency debasement, and I don't think they need to. Understanding the spiritual side of Bitcoin for a lot of people might just be the missing piece to help it make sense. This is why I decided to write my new book, The Tao of Bitcoin, which is available on Amazon now in Kindle and print. So if you're interested to learn something about how Bitcoin has the potential to change the fundamental underlying foundation of human interaction, I'd love for you to check it out. We'll include a link to buy the book in the show notes. You I've often thought one of the great, you know, ahas I had about fiat money as the result of thinking about Bitcoin is the absurdity that in the internet age, money as a technology is still something that doesn't work when you leave your country. So I'm, I'm in Canada. And when I want to go to Sweden, my, my money, that technology doesn't work. And that, that doesn't make any sense for, for where we are. And yeah, I like this. Um, you know, so it's almost like this physical mega structure of the internet. These are like proto Dyson sphere style technologies. And one thing I think that is hard for people to, uh, conceptualize because Bitcoin, the network through nodes and miners is decentralized and distributed all over the world. 
were you to be able to assemble this thing into one physical machine, like if Bitcoin were just all of Bitcoin, all of the miners and nodes were moved to one spot in Texas, that would probably be a pretty impressive structure. But it's, 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 you can't do that. So it's hard. It's like, it's almost hard for us to understand uh, the physical reality of this planetary technology. Sure. And it is a mega structure in the sense that it spans the entire globe. And I mean, and, and just a side note on that, I, uh, this is a pet peeve of mine. Like when people talk about the decentralization of Bitcoin in the context of mining, it almost becomes a moot point because what matters is not that miners are centralized or decentralized. That doesn't matter. Uh, what matters is the nodes. Like the uh, miners, they only sell a commodity to people who run nodes. They sell block space. That's what they do. They are service providers. and if you were around for the block war, the block size wars in 2016, 2017, I mean, that was a scary time because we didn't know then. The conclusion of that battle, which was, which was for the listeners uh, who weren't around, the battle was that there were, the miners wanted to increase the block size uh, in order to get more revenue. And, but the notes did not accept the, uh, the, the blocks that were supposed to have bigger a bigger block space that would fit more transactions. And the conclusion of that battle was that the nodes decide, people decide, uh, not the miners. The miners are just service providers. So it doesn't really matter if they are centralized or not. That's, that's not important because if they become centralized, it would be other people will start mining and it, like it, it, it naturally sort of becomes more and more decentralized over time, I think. But that's not what matters. What matters is that nodes are decentralized because the nodes decide the consensus rules of the of the network there's a fascinating sort of point to connect there too because the nodes sort of are the people running the nodes so it's almost like that you know the the nodes we're, we're really talking about the collective consciousness of the bitcoin network and it is sort of this amoeba an energy field or something planetary consciousness yes exactly I also think, you know, I was listening to you talk about, you know, I keep coming back to this idea around mastery over all of the energy on the planet. And I think it's it's coincidental or it's interesting that Bitcoin is really an energy network that is also useful in sort of quantifying energy. Maybe you could just talk a little bit about that. Sure, for sure. So like I said, like Bitcoin is a card of type one money, not only because it allows us to organize like um, type one civilization, but also because it's, it is uh, fundamentally an energy technology. So the, the Kardashev scale is about control of energy and Bitcoin is ultimately an energy technology. So I think that is where we uh, should, should start. And there are a lot of, there are a lot of misconceptions surrounding Bitcoin's energy use and energy use in, uh, in general. Like, there is this cultural narrative, which I believe is very harmful, that energy use is bad. And I think that is very anti-human because uh, there, there is this movement that advocates for the regression towards a much simpler society, an agrarian society, basically, which our ancestors fought very, very hard to escape. And this is not a place where we want to go back to. The Bitcoin has this transformative effect on how we, how we use energy, how we, um, how we produce energy, how we consume energy, how we uh, transport energy, how we store energy, and how we uh, think about energy. And uh, a lot, like like the the criticism that Bitcoin uses a lot of energy is like. I think the best response to that is yes, it does, and it's worth it. It's it's exactly what it's supposed to do. Like our the evolution of human society is basically about inventing more technologies that save us time, that make us more efficient. That is what technology does. Like if you want to to row on a kayak across the Atlantic Ocean because it saves energy. You're welcome to do so, but I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, so instead, we we uh, have invented airplanes, which consume a lot more energy because it's worth it. And we have built washing machines, which 
consume a lot more energy than washing clothes by hand because it's worth it. It makes us more efficient. We should have innovation and we should excuse their energy consumption because energy consumption in, in and of itself is not bad. It is good. It is what drives us forward. It is what saves lives. It, was, it is what improves our lives and our civilization. And so I think I just want to get that out, out of the way first because we need to be on the same page that energy consumption is not bad. It, it, it is also a human right to consume energy in whatever form that you see fit, as long as you don't harm others, of course. If you want to use Christmas lights or watch the Kardashians, that's fine. That is your, your expression of energy. You're, you're free to do so. And if you want to send rockets to Mars, or if you want to, to provide security for the the most fair and transparent and best monetary network ever conceived, you are welcome to do so. And that is how I choose to uh, use my energy. So we need to be on the same page that energy consumption in and of itself is not bad. And so the idea that Bitcoin is the problem is just is wrong from first principles. It's the solution. It doesn't boil the oceans. It saves them. And it doesn't, it doesn't threaten civilization. It, it elevates it. And it does in five ways, I think. First of all, and this is how this uh, this is where we talk about Bitcoin as an energy technology, not as a communication technology. We need Bitcoin as a communication technology in order to organize like a type one civilization. But as an energy technology, it also allows us to climb the Kardashev scale as it does these five things. First, it monetizes cheap, inaccessible energy. And I think a lot of people have heard this before. It monetizes cheap, inaccessible energy, meaning that before we couldn't really produce energy uh, in places far away from the grid. Off-grid energy has, hasn't had value, but now we have monetized this inaccessible energy, which now lets us produce energy in faraway places. And this has not existed before, basically. So uh, monetization of inaccessible energy is a very important uh, thing that Bitcoin has given us. The second thing is, is tied to that, and it is the Alex Gladstein the theory of um, rescuing stranded energy. So there is energy being produced in faraway places that just uh, doesn't have value that we cannot access because it's too far away from the grid. This orphaned energy, Bitcoin now allows us to make use of. Because wherever there is energy, Bitcoin will go. Bitcoin miners will go there and happily accept this energy. Wherever there is, um, like when we are close to the grid, there's B Bitcoin miners basically just use the energy that is virtually free. Because wherever, whenever we are inside a grid, you and I who consume the energy, we will bid up the price of that energy. And Bitcoin mining, Bitcoin mining is an incredibly competitive operation, meaning that it will not be lucrative to set up a mining operation in, uh, in a big city. It just won't be. You have to have basically free energy, which you can only get far away from the grid. So when, and this allows us to start creating, producing energy in faraway places, which gives energy to these small villages in Africa or in, in Siberia. So now they can also have benefit from the energy production there. And Bitcoin harnesses that energy. It harvests that energy, that excess energy. And, th and that's already happening today, you know, for our, for our listeners. Yeah, 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 yeah for sure. Yeah, th these are not just ideas. These things are actually happening. Like, uh, for example, there are companies that have now set up mining operations in Africa based on like methane gas and stuff like that. And they use the heat from the uh, mining equipment to dry tea leaves. So that is also good. And the third thing that Bitcoin does is that it introduces uh, a flexibility to the energy system by letting us transport the value of energy without spillage. So now what we do is uh, we have to transport energy. We sell it to other countries, we buy it from other countries, we produce it in outside of the grid and that we have to transport it with 
pipes and lines and ta tankers and trucks and stuff. Um, and there's a lot of spillage in that. What Bitcoin allows us to do is that it allows us to transport the value of that energy seamlessly without spillage. So now we can produce energy in a faraway place and we can transport the value of that energy with Bitcoin because Bitcoin moves seamlessly across the globe. So we can move the value of that energy into a place that is near the grid and produce energy with that money near the grid. So that introduces a flexibility into the system, which, is, uh, which hasn't existed before. And the fourth thing is that, and this is important, Bitcoin incentivizes innovation in the energy sector, like we have seen with uh, cases in Siberia and Africa where we set up mining operations. And we have to sort of be innovative in, in this approach. Like how, how can we make use of volcanoes, of, of cow dung, of methane gas, of all these kinds of resources that exist naturally, but that we don't really use? And I think this is an early step, a baby step towards being able to actually harness the energy of volcanoes fully and to harness the energy of uh, tectonic plate movements uh, because we need to have the financial incentive to do these things. And now we do. And here's the, very, the, the most important thing, the, the very most important part about Bitcoin as an energy technology driving us up the Kardash of scale. And it is that the, when we, is, let's say we have fusion power in, in a couple of decades and we have virtually... We have abundant energy that has approached the marginal cost of production, which will be virtually zero. So we will not have to pay for energy for our, our everyday uses. Say we get to that level of civilization, energy is virtually free. Well, what happens with Bitcoin then is that we have this, this magical and wonderful innovation in Bitcoin, a uh, part, part of Bitcoin's, it's, it's very heart, it's very center, the soul of Bitcoin which is the difficult adjustment. The difficult adjustment is, I think, the most enigmatic and wonderful part of Bitcoin, except possibly proof of work. And the difficult adjustment, I'm sure your listeners are very sophisticated and are aware of what this is. This might actually be the first time that term has come up on the show. So, uh... Uh, Sure. So what the difficulty adjustment does, it is this. So what miners do, is that they guess random numbers. They produce, uh, they, they produce a block. And when they produce a block, they fill it with transactions and then they broadcast it to the network. But in order to, for uh, them to be able to broadcast that block to the network for everybody to be able to accept it. So I run a node, it's right over there, and, and uh, my node is constantly listening for new blocks. And when it, it, it hears that there's a new block, uh, it grabs it and attaches it to my my local blockchain that I have stored on my hard drive, and it does this across the entire planet. Everybody's nodes uh, is listening to uh, for new blocks, but in order for the miners to be able to broadcast that block, they need to complete it. So constructing the actual block and filling it with transactions that's not the difficult part. The difficult part is to make so that the SHA two hundred fifty six hash of the entire block becomes this is simplified becomes smaller than a certain set of, um, th than a certain number. And so the, the bigger that number is, the easier it is for the miner to uh, just, uh, let me back up, sorry. It was, it's been a while since I explained this. So in the block, there is a field where, let's say the miner completes the block and they make a hash of the block and the, it has a certain number. So then when you uh, change anything about the block, just uh, just uh, any transaction, the order of transactions, um, any number, any the smallest detail, the hash of that block will be completely different. There is no correlation between the input and the output whatsoever. You can input the entire works of William Shakespeare into a hash function, and it will churn out a hash. And you can input just the letter A, and it, you will have no idea which is which. So you cannot correlate, there's no correlation between input and output. You always get a 256-bit output from the hash of anything. And you can change that output in its totality completely by just changing the smallest, the smallest part. So what the miners have is that they have a field in the block where they can try different numbers. 
So they try different numbers in that field. They complete the block and then they try one number and they hash the block. And if the hash of that block is smaller than a certain predetermined number, it is, it is publishable. They can broadcast to the network. So the bigger that number is, the easier it is uh, for them to find a number that will make the hash of the block smaller than that number. But if the number is very small, it becomes more uh, difficult for them to find a number that will make the hash of the block smaller than that number. That makes sense, right? So this number is changed automatically every 216 blocks or roughly every two weeks uh, because blocks arrive in, ten, on average, 10 minutes. 10 minutes ab- um, intervals. So every two weeks or every 216 blocks, there is a, a check that, that recalibrates the difficulty adjust, uh, adjustment, which is this number. So if the average time for the past 216 blocks or the past two weeks has been, uh, say, 12 minutes instead of 10 minutes, that means that the uh, the difficulty of mining blocks of constructing blocks has has been too difficult so they will make the number so the protocol will make the number bigger automatically so it will be easier for miners to find a number that makes the hash of the block below the target number the target number it's called and if the time has uh, the average time of finding blocks and publishing blocks has been 8 minutes or 9 minutes or 7 minutes it means that it has been too easy to find blocks because the, uh, the pulse of Bitcoin, the heart rate of Bitcoin is supposed to be 10 minutes. It is the, the difficulty adjustment acts like the pacemaker of Bitcoin's pulse. It keeps it steady at 10 minutes. So if it has been, if it, if, if it has taken eight minutes on average to find every block, it has been too easy. So the difficulty adjustment will make the target number smaller so that it's more difficult for miners to find numbers that will make the hash of the block smaller than the target number. So that, that is how the difficulty adjustment works. And the difficulty adjustment, it, it is more than just a clever invention to keep the pulse of Bitcoin steady every 10 minutes. It is the actual driver for our continued journey up the Kardashev scale because it will continue to provide a financial incentive for us to produce more and more energy, even if we have free, virtually uh, free and abundant energy, it will become, that's the target number, will become smaller and smaller and smaller forever as energy becomes cheaper. So it doesn't matter if energy becomes virtually free because the difficulty adjustment produces, it acts like like a black hole for energy. It will just get smaller and Bitcoin will be as hungry for energy as it has always been. Bitcoin eats the amount of energy that we feed it, and it will always ask for more if we give it to it. It will never be satisfied. And the difficult adjustments makes sure that there's always a financial incentive to give Bitcoin more energy. And for this reason, the difficult adjustment acts like an engine for us to continue to produce more and more energy. Because there, is, there will always be a financial incentive now uh, for us to produce more energy. So, and as long as there is financial incentive for us to produce more energy, we will. We will find ways to decentralize energy production, make it cheaper, make it more efficient, and find new ways of producing energy. And the more energy that we can produce, the farther along the Kardashev scale we will climb. And this race the competition for controlling the most energy, it has already begun. It is the new Cold War among nations. The first Cold War we had was for uh, the control of space because war doesn't have to be destructive. War, wars can be actually productive. The better we get at fighting wars, the, the more productive and less harmful they become. Uh, like now we have excluded the humans from the, from the loop, basically, by letting our drones fight. So now we have our toys fight each other. The Ukraine and Russia war is, of course, uh, an, 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 an anomaly. They are fighting like we did in the 20th century. But if we look at the trend, we are going towards a future where, where, where we exchange blood and rubble for electricity. We fight with our drones, we fight with our toys, and we will have cold wars instead of hot wars where we fight 
for control of resources like space and energy. So our, in our first Cold War, we fight for control of the moon. And this, the, year, the United States of America won. The Russia came in a close second, but they were also the only ones fighting. So uh, I, like to th- I like to think of Russia as coming in second rather than losing. And in our coming Cold Wars, I think that the fight over Bitcoin uh, is going to be the next Cold War, and it will be through the fight for control over energy. And sort of all of these things place us on a, on a progression towards the end state of ultimately harnessing all of the energy that would be available to us on Earth. And so is Bitcoin the technology then that is responsible for our ultimate uh, ascension to a type one civilization? It is, first of all, permissive of our climb up the Kardashev scale because we need it to organize like a type one civili- civilization. And it also, as I said, uh, these five things, it, it, is, uh, it monetizes cheap and inaccessible energy, it, it rescues stranded energy, it uh, introduces flexibility to, into the energy sector, it, uh, it provides financial incentive for innovation, and did we have difficult adjustment that provides a black hole for, uh, for energy consumption. And all of these things together, especially the idea that Bitcoin just eats energy and it never gets full. It is a black hole for energy and it continues to provide financial incentives for us to feed it energy. That will be a driver for our continued search for production of cheap energy in an efficient way and whatever ways we can, we will produce energy and we will feed it to Bitcoin because there is a financial incentive to do so. I'm going to ask you one last question, I, and I, I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to ask it, but you know, I, I think that the other side of understanding, getting back to our very first part of the conversation time about fiat money, money as a technology does store energy already. And this idea that money is a store of energy is one that I think people before Bitcoin, or as they're getting into Bitcoin, ha- have a hard time wrapping their heads around. So Bitcoin is a is a literal energy technology for measuring the the output and consumption of energy as you've sort of illustrated but it's also this sort of figurative store of energy and uh so the, there's a sort of a, a cognitive overlap between again how we what this thing actually does and what it causes us to how it causes us to think about what it does maybe the question to to, to wrap up is what does the next phase of human understanding of bitcoin look like as you imagine it unfolding wow i love that question what does our next phase of understanding bitcoin look like that's the question right so the boring answer is that what we need for bitcoin is infrastructure that is where we are right now we we are it, it is a we're working on infrastructure and mainstream adoption basically and these are things that you and I as Bitcoiners, we care about it, but it's not that exciting. Like, sure, it's exciting that more people discover it, but it's nothing new. We just, we just, sure, we want everybody to discover Bitcoin like you and I have. And that's the phase we're in right now. The uh, mainstream, when, when Bitcoin enters mainstream consciousness, and we're also in the phase of developing instru- infrastructure in order to be able to invite all of the rest of the world. But when it comes to like the next phase of actually understanding what Bitcoin is, because what we're what we're doing now as um, as Bitcoin philosophers, we tend to dress Bitcoin in different kind of clothes and see what fits. Because this is an entirely new thing; we don't know what it is. We're trying to understand what it is, but nobody knows what Bitcoin is. We can have all kinds of answers to what it is. It is it is a protocol. It is money. It is a, a digital asset. It is a, a it is a technology for storing wealth. It is um, a communication technology. Um, it is a network. Uh, we can we can look at it in all of these ways. But and as I said, the 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 what I'm exploring right now is Bitcoin as a driver for our journey up the Kardashev scale, and Bitcoin as an economic psychedelic. But when it comes to like the next phase for uh, understanding Bitcoin on a general level. I think we're going to look at it more and more as an as an energy technology. 
rather than just a monetary technology. I think that is going to be the next thing that enters mainstream consciousness after they realize, after people realize that it is truly um, a fascinating monetary technology, but it's not just a monetary technology. It's also an energy technology. And I think that will have such an impact on how we organize as a society and uh, how we change a society that, that it will be impossible to ignore the fact that Bitcoin is an energy technology that changes how we produce, consume, store, and think about energy. There's, there's a lot to think about there. I feel like I'm going to be laying in bed tonight, replaying this conversation. And uh, I'll, I'll, I wish I could have you back again tomorrow to, to do part two. Maybe we'll, we'll have to do that another time. Yoni, uh, thank you so much for coming on and sharing with us your, your insights and ideas. For listeners that want to find more of you online or to find your books, uh, we'll include some resources, but but where where can they go? Oh, they can. Um, so I'm on Twitter under Yoni Appleberg, I think. Is it Yoni dot Appleberg? No, it's just Yoni Appleberg. And uh, I am on YouTube. That's actually how I started my contribution to the Bitcoin space as a content creator on YouTube. And I think quite a few people have seen some of my videos, but very few people know that I that I'm the creator behind them. I make these uh, cartoon like animations explaining the like the philosophy behind Bitcoin and some technical aspects. And a lot of people use my YouTube channel to orange pill their friends. So um, if you need um, something for that, please go ahead and look up uh, Yoni Appleberg on uh, on YouTube. I collaborated quite a bit with Knut Swanholm and Guy Swan there as well. And uh, to find my book, Abundance Through Scarcity, uh, you can find it on Amazon, but for some that might be the easiest, but there's also on bitcoinbook.shop, published with Consensus Network, and they run also bitcoinbook.shop. So Abundance Through Scarcity, I personally highly recommend it. I There's a second edition coming out now, very soon. Uh, I think um, we're launching it for the BTC Prague conference. So if you want a copy now of the first edition, uh, it will run out pretty soon. So there will never be more of the first edition ever. So I keep, um, I have my copy. I have one copy of my own book uh, of the first edition and I'm, and uh, I'm holding on to it because uh, it will never be, you will never be able to buy it again. But the, the second edition is a much needed, um, uh, touch up some new ideas some ideas have uh, i have expanded on some i have removed and it's it's a much needed touch up and it reads quite di- differently so i would highly recommend uh, people reading the second edition and it's coming coming out soon very cool i will uh, put that on my reading list awesome thank you again and if you are listening and you made it to the end of the show i want to thank you as well for tuning in your attention is a currency and i so appreciate you uh, paying attention to the show like subscribe hope to see you again next week Thanks for listening to this episode of The Block Reward. We're trying to do something different here, creating accessible conversations meant for people who aren't obsessed with Bitcoin. If you found this episode informative and engaging, hit that subscribe button to make sure you stay updated with future episodes. Your feedback matters. We'd greatly appreciate it if you could take a moment to share your reviews and help us with our goal of creating Bitcoin content that is simple and easy to understand. Bitcoin has an important role to play in the future of finance. It will change the way we save, spend, and invest. Discover why Bitcoin offers a game-changing opportunity for forward-thinking employers by visiting BlockRewards.ca. BlockRewards' mission is helping Canadian employers implement strategies for integrating Bitcoin into compensation and benefits. Supercharge your recruitment and retention strategies and help your team members plan for the rising cost of living by rewarding their work with the hardest money ever invented. Special thanks to our top sponsor, Paramount Employee Benefits Consulting, Canada's only Bitcoin Forward Benefits and Pension Advisory. For more information, find them at ParamountBenefits.ca. Big shout out to Podigy, our production team that makes all this possible, and BMX Escape for producing our music. Bitcoin is an expansive and dense topic many people walk away from early. To Bitcoin enthusiasts looking for that podcast they can share with friends, family, and colleagues, one they'll actually listen to, we hope that is us. The content of these conversations is meant to be provided for information purposes only. Nothing here is investment advice. Bitcoin is a big topic. Be sure to do your own research before making any personal financial decisions. Thanks for listening.